so I'll, I'll do a brief introduction to uh, who the Hive is, and, and then I'm going to introduce Lance Riddell here, uh, who will introduce the, the speaker. So, so the Hive incubates, funds, and launches data-driven startups. Many of you have been here before. Um, we are a collection of, um, of serial entrepreneurs, technology people, of venture capitalists. So if you have a chance, say hello to Lance Riddell, Russell Journey, Pashu Christensen, uh, Vibha is also somewhere behind, uh, who are all here, Vibha right there. So it's a, it's a whole team of people who work closely with our companies on, on various aspects, business design, technology, go to market, helping them with customers, partners, and so forth. Um, our particular focus is on applications that are data driven. So in the overall big data space, we focus on applications and typically invest in the seed stage uh, up to about three million. And, and so we are, uh, and in this new year, aggressively looking for uh, hot entrepreneurs. Uh, if you are one of them and are looking to start a company in any one of these functional areas, any of these vertical areas, please reach out to us. Um, our startups are also hiring a number of the the entrepreneurs, founders of our startups are here today. So we're looking for Java engineers, UX and UI developers, Hadoop engineers, data scientists, our security companies looking for a VP of engineering. So reach out to us at, at uh, jobs at hivedata.com. Um, in a few weeks, Russell is sitting way behind. Uh, Russell is the data scientist in residence at the Hive. He just came out with a book called Agile Data Science. So uh, uh, join, join us. Um, and uh, he's not as scary looking in person. <laughs> uh, thank you to our, our sponsors, uh, Juniper, Dell, Microsoft, uh, Wilson, Sonsini, Perkins Cui. They, they help fund our, because our investors help fund our companies. And we do a lot of these type of events. So these great sponsors help do that. Um, for today's event, uh, use the hashtag HiveData. For, uh, there you see it on the, on the bottom. Let's get the conversation going on, on Twitter. Um, the format that we'll have, uh, Lance will just come in to introduce the, the main speaker. Um, and, and so the, the main speaker will, will speak for till about 7.40, 7.45. And then uh, Derek Harris, who is a technology reporter at GigaOM, will, will have a little chat with, with, uh, with our main speaker and also take questions along the way. So we'll keep this going till about 8.30. We, on, on behalf of the Hive, uh, we deeply appreciate the support of NetApp. I want to just call upon uh, Val to just say a few words. All this food, this great uh, wine, this venue, all thanks to NetApp. <laughs> Easiest applause I've ever had. So my name is Val Berkovici, and tonight I am the big data czar at NetApp. Uh, we've been hosting these events with the Hive for over a year now. They started off big. And you know, every year, true to big data, they just keep getting bigger and bigger. In fact, we do this about two or three times a year. Overwhelming attendance tonight. It's, it's phenomenal to see all the people here. It's not just because of me, I think, but uh, <laughs> I'll, take the, I'll take all you know, the, the attention we can get. NetApp, obviously, the oldest pun in the big data business is big data equals big storage. So we're happy to be associated with the Hive, sponsor these events, get the conversation going. I'd encourage you actually to look at some of the prior events we've hosted. There was a really phenomenal debate we had about a year ago, Clash of the Titans, I think we called it. Uh, elephant Riders. Elephant Riders uh, with all the major distributions. I won't name them for risk of, of, of ignoring some of the Hadoop distributions out there, but a fantastic, engaging discussion. And uh, even though it's a different format tonight, I'm very much looking forward to seeing Derek and Doug go at it and talk about the present and, and the future of big data. So with that, Thank you very much. No slides. Have a good time tonight. Enjoy the food and drink. Hi, thank you, Val. We, we deeply appreciate all of your support in the course of last year and look forward to uh, continuing to do this. So with that, I'd like to introduce Lance Riddle, the CTO of The Hive.
All right, it's, uh, it's my great honor to introduce uh, Doug Cutting tonight. Um, first off, I'd like a show of hands of anyone here that thinks that Doug's influenced your career. A show of hands, yeah, quite a few. Um, me uh, also, um, going all the way back to Lucene, Lucene was one of uh, the very first open source projects I got my hands on and was just uh, absolutely shocked at the power in my hands and what open source could do. Um, his leadership in the, in the uh, open source community is well known also and what, uh, what it is capable of. He did a stint as the Apache uh, Chairman Foundation and uh, has really been a mentor in the open source process. Um, and none of these projects that, that we all are involved in would have been possible without with all that. And of course, the granddaddy right now, uh, Hadoop, uh, which uh, again, many of us uh, in this room are, are using to transform the, the world of data. And uh, also, I've had the honor of uh, working uh, some with Doug. He was uh, an advisor to my company. And uh, there I learned how much of he's a generous, humble, uh, just a great, fun guy. So uh, Doug Cutting. Thanks, Lance. Sir. So wow, a lot of folks here. Um, so I'm not really a, a futurist. I'm a, I'm a programmer. I'm a developer. Uh, and I've, as Lance implied, uh, started a few open source projects that have been successful. And people always ask me, you know, what's next? Tell us about the future. And they, they expect me to see it. And you know, I, don't, I don't really believe I can predict the future. I don't believe anybody can very well. And so I'm, I'm sort of stumped. I'm, you know, I, I, I don't have a a time machine uh, that, will, that will take me to the future and let me look around and come back and, and tell you about it much. Um, uh, Google helps a lot. Google lives a couple years in the future and we can sort of look at what they've done and, and get a lot of ideas because they, they've been doing uh, many of the things that, that I'm interested in, in working on for longer, um, uh, provide a lot of input. Um, but uh, still, it's a, it's a tough topic. Um, so one morning in the shower where I have all my, my good ideas, I, uh, I realized something that there's a lot of future prediction in facts. Um, uh, we're used to this in, in science, in, in physics, for example. If you think about what, what velocity is, um, velocity is not just a statement about the present. It's a, it's a prediction about the future. And it's a statement about the past, right? It's something that happens over, over time. Um, so, so some facts make good predictions. Another example, think of a, a rocket. Um, if you know where a rocket is, uh, you know how fast it's going, you know which direction it's pointed, uh, you can predict reasonably reliably about where it's going to land. Reliably enough that if it's got people on it, you're going to go and, and send somebody out to visit, to, to pick them up. Uh, if it's got a bomb on it, you're going to try to get out of the way. Um, so you're going you're to make your plans based on these predictions. Um, you, there's no certainty the rocket's going to hit there. there you know, a meteorite could come in, somebody could shoot it down, but most likely that's what's going to happen. So what I want to try to do uh, in this talk is identify some facts that are like this, that have within them predictions. Uh, so facts that I hope we can all agree on um, and give us predictions that are accurate enough that we can make plans uh, around them. So we'll start with a uh, classic simple one to get, get warmed up. Um, uh, Moore's law has been uh, in effect for uh, close to 50 years now, depending on when you, when you think it started, um, uh, stating that the number of transistors in a processor um, will double about every 18 months, um, and it's been approximately correct. Um, uh, more fundamentally, what we've seen is the affordability of computing hardware uh, decrease, or the affordability increase um, uh, tremendously over that time, exponentially, uh, for 50 years. Uh, memory's gotten cheaper, uh, processing's gotten cheaper, storage, networking, all of these things uh, have gotten much, much more powerful. And you take compounded growth for 50 years at a pretty aggressive rate, and what that gives us is phenomenal amount of computation uh, for very reasonable prices. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing if you, if you take the time to think about it. I won't encourage you to do that because I need your minds here now. Um, 
so what is, the, what is the prediction that we can, we can take from this about data? Um, well, it seems clear that in the future, we'll be able to store and process more data than we can today. Certainly than we could in the past, and, and probably more tomorrow. Pretty safe. All right, so uh, we can afford to process data. Why do we, why do we care? Data is incredibly valuable. Um, the big driver, the reason that we have this abundance of hardware is that people have been buying hardware and driving the price down and driving the efficiencies up. Uh, and they've been deploying it throughout their businesses, across industries. Uh, you know, if I look at, at Cloudera's customers, we've got them in just about every major industry. Um, agriculture, uh, uh, oil, banking, finance, healthcare, I uh, hope I haven't missed any favorites, the internet, um, uh, you, you name it. Um, uh, folks are um, uh, interested in, in data. They have a lot of data. Uh, I've, I've heard it said that um, the rate of growth in an industry is, these days is proportional to the degree to that it's, it's adopting uh, technology. That technology is a, is a driver, fundamental driver of growth in our economy. This, this isn't a surprise. And, so as companies adopt technology, as cash registers become computers, as phones become computers, uh, as, just, as refrigerators become computers, cars become computers, as all these things become computers, they have data flowing through them. And this data tells a story about the, the business, about the, the, the function of, of that device uh, and the, the business of its vendor. Um, and that data Gives, these, gives whoever collects it um, the ability to see themselves, uh, to see what they're doing, and therefore improve. You can't improve if you don't know what you are. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty fundamental. We've got uh, devices, they generate data in the, the process of doing their business, which maybe just passes through our fingers, but maybe we can collect it and benefit from it and use it to optimize and improve what we're doing. Uh, so, prediction we can draw from this, from the value of data, is not only can we afford to store and process more data in the future, but we can't afford not to if we want to be successful uh, and if we want to remain competitive. Um, uh, you've got to think about how you can utilize the data that's, uh, that's, that's passing through your, your business uh, as you go about it. Um, so, okay, got some hardware. Cheap, we got some data that's valuable. Um, we need some software to process it. Uh, in the last decade, I think we've really seen open source software uh, become dominant, especially in platforms, uh, first with Linux, and then with uh, Android, and in lots of other cases you can, you can probably think about. You know, be Linux is Android, uh, if somebody wants to pick nits. Um, but, uh, People appreciate uh, having a platform that is independent of a vendor. Uh, they don't like the idea that, uh, of building their business atop technology um, uh, that they have no control over um, and that the vendor can arbitrarily raise the price of. Uh, that's, a, that's a very dangerous scenario. And in the past decades um, uh, of our technological society, people have learned to be wary about that and prefer solutions where at least the core technologies um, are open source um, and will have a life independent of any commercial organization uh, and, um, and can be uh, used without, without fee um, forever. Uh, so this, is, this has been a theme. And, and I think the prediction that, that I would make from this is that we won't see um, popular platform technologies emerge in the future uh, that aren't open source. Uh, I, think, I think that's a requirement now um, that, that we see from users. Um, uh, I know when I started Lucene, uh, and uh, it's, it's, I think, rapidly become uh, probably the most popular search software library out there, not necessarily because it's any better. I mean, I'm proud of it. I think it's, a, I think it, it's, a, it's good technology. Um, but fundamentally, it was competing against uh, proprietary solutions, and people prefer 
the open source. A lot of it is the free price. A lot of it is the lack of lock-in. A lot of it is the, the transparency of the process. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of attractions. I'm not going to go into it um, in depth here. We can talk about it later in questions. Um, but I, I, I strongly believe that platform technologies will be open source in the future. So OK, we know what kind of software, um, uh, uh, or, or at least the methodology that we might use. Uh, what, what software should we use for our data? Around 2002 or three or something like that, uh, I was working on building an, an open source web search engine. I, I had the, this uh, naive idea that, that we could build a, an open source version of what Google does. Um, uh, it was ambitious, um, uh, but you know, it was, why not? Find, find this guy, Let, let's go for it. Um, so we started working on this. Uh, had a couple of us working part time on it. Um, got a little trickle of funding. Um, from, from some sugar daddies, and uh, we, um, we knew it had to be distributed. Uh, we knew that the, the web, even in 2002, was um, uh, more data than you could fit or process easily on a single computer. Um, we had a shoestring budget, so we were buying the least expensive hardware we could. Uh, and so we developed a distributed approach to doing this, to crawling and uh, analyzing, indexing, and searching um, uh, the entire web. We built this using Lucene as a building block, as a, as a search library, but there was a lot of other things we had to do along the way. Uh, we got it to the point where it ran on a handful, you know, five or, or so um, nodes at a time. Uh, it took me watching it pretty much full time to keep it running. A lot of manual steps of shuffling files around, uh, you know, between nodes, SCP here and there, um, and watching when, when things completed. Um, and it became pretty clear that that wasn't, it was theoretically scalable, but it wasn't practically scalable because it was, it was operationally onerous. We'd, it would take hundreds of people to scale it to you know, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of machines. Uh, around this time, Google published a couple of papers. First, they published one about their, uh, uh, the Google file system, GFS, um, uh, and then about a year later, uh, about a system called MapReduce, uh, which is a framework for doing reliable distributed processing across a, a bunch of machines, presumably running a, a distributed file system like GFS, very, very complementary. Um, and it was, you know, a light bulb went off. This uh, would automate um, all the operational uh, problems I was having uh, and make it much easier to run things like this. Um, uh, and I also realized, you know, everybody was talking about the paper saying, wow, isn't this awesome stuff that Google, Google's doing? Wouldn't it be fun to have that technology? But nobody had it because they had, you had, or well, nobody had. People who worked at Google had it, but unless you worked at Google, which is a pretty small percentage of the software world, um, you didn't have this stuff. You could just hear about it and salivate. Uh, uh, well, you know, I've had some experience with open source. Um, an open source implementation to this would probably be useful to a lot of people. Um, so we went about implementing this uh, with this, this project Nutch. The, the open source web search uh, project. And it took us a couple of years, um, and we had Nutch moved over, running on top of these methods. In fact, the, the algorithms, the flow of the data was very similar, almost identical to what we were already doing in Nutch, but now it was automated, and in particular, the reliability was automated. Um, and so we could run it whoa, on uh, 20 or 40 nodes. I was working at the Internet Archive at the time, uh, able to get you know, a small cluster there. Mike was a grad student, Mike Caffarella, who was my, my uh, partner in, in this, um, was as a grad student at University of Washington. Uh, and um, he, was, he also had a small cluster. And so we could run it. We could run it on 20 to 40 nodes, um, crawl uh, you know, maybe uh, 10 times as, as much data using 10 times the number of machines and with a tenth of the operational um, uh, you know, effort. So it was, it was a huge advance. Um, but also, it still required a fair amount of watching. Uh, we only could run it on 20 to 40 nodes because that's all we had. Each time we tried to run it longer or on bigger things, we found ways in which it broke. Um, it was, you know, it was limping along. Running is, is maybe a strong word uh, uh, for, for where we were. Uh, and I realized that it wasn't going to get to the point where it fulfilled its promise, where it ran on hundreds or thousands of processors 
um, and really scaled to petabytes um, without a lot more work, without a lot more people than two part-time guys. Um, and uh, you know, first we needed somebody who had 1,000 processors to run it on. Um, around that time, uh, Yahoo approached me. Uh, this is uh, early 2006. Um, I, I joined Yahoo. They had a large team that they said they wanted to work on this, this kind of thing. They wanted to adopt this as the basis um, and make it, make it scale, make it, make it work really well. Um, so uh, we, in, in January 2006, took the distributed file system and MapReduce part uh, out of Nutch, started a new project. Um, uh, so a lot of the code in it was you know, dated back to 2002. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the code that's still there uh, go, goes back. Um, uh, but started a new project called Hadoop um, uh, for, for just the distributed computing platform part and left the rest of the web search part uh, in, in Nutch. Um, uh, Hadoop was named after my son's little yellow stuffed elephant. We had a, a ready uh, uh, icon and mascot uh, in, in the yellow elephant. It was a, it was a, it was a good, good package deal there. Um, and uh, Yahoo set off to developing it, and, and I worked with the team there. Um, and in about two years, we really had it scaling to thousands of nodes um, and petabyte computations that took multiple days to run uh, and ran pretty reliably. It set the um, uh, sorting world benchmark um, for a terabyte um, uh, in, in 2008. Um, and so it really arrived. You know, it was sort of time to put up the big mission accomplished banner uh, there in, in 2008. We, we had a um, web scalable uh, open source um, distributed computing engine uh, in, in Hadoop at that point. Um, uh, was a, was, a, was a, a great accomplishment and, and wouldn't have gotten there without the investment of, of, of Yahoo taking this, this seriously. But it still had a lot of limitations. And uh, now it's scaled and it was fairly reliable, but it wasn't very secure. Um, so that was the, the next thing that got attacked was trying to um, make it so that you could have different groups sharing and not be able to necessarily see everything that one another were doing. Uh, to, to get some, some, some uh, security in there. Um, uh, Yahoo had legal reasons um, why they needed to protect uh, some things from, uh, from all employees. Um, uh, so then got that one. Uh, next thing that was, uh, you know, limitation was noticed was the, a lot, so there was a single point of failure in the file system. It wasn't, it was mostly available unless this one particular machine went down and then the whole thing would go down. Um, which also meant that if you needed to upgrade uh, you had this single point that you had to take down, which means you had to take everything down every time you upgraded the software, which was a pain. Uh, that was a bigger pain because that, was, that happened a lot more often uh, than the, the scheduled downtime than unscheduled downtime. Uh, so a lot of work went into removing that single point of failure and really getting the high availability uh, that, that is required and expected of a system like this. Um, subsequently, you know, continuing to see fundamental improvements uh, in this this, this basic uh, technology. Um, recently, we've seen a lot of work on uh, trying to do a better job of uh, load management between different groups. You've got a, somebody who uh, wants to be executing real-time queries on a cluster. You've got somebody else um, who has a batch job that needs to run every 10 minutes and has to finish in 10 minutes. Uh, and you've got some other guy who's a researcher, and if you've got some time left over, please run his stuff. Um, so you've got different kinds of SLAs as well, and, and using the hardware effectively is also really important. So not only do you want to guarantee that you, that you can do the things that you've, you promise people, but you want to do it in the most efficient way possible. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of work recently on scheduling. So again and again, uh, Hadoop has removed a lot of these limitations and gotten better. Uh, and so I think the, the prediction we can make as it is going to continue to do so. Uh, people are going to continue to find um, uh, limitations uh, and remove them as more and more people start to build around this, um, which, which leads us to what's happened outside of this kernel. Uh, there's been this tremendous growth of projects around Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop is, ha has this file system, has a MapReduce engine. Shortly after, uh, Hadoop was out there in, in probably in you know, 08 and 09 and, and those years, we started to see systems built on top of it. 
One of the first ones was a system called PIG, uh, which is an um, uh, imperative uh, data flow language uh, that, that uh, emits MapReduce jobs on the back end. So where, where we had this reliable, distributed, scalable platform, it was only useful to people who wanted to do batch computations and who were Java programmers. But by adding PIG, people no longer had to be Java programmers. They could be uh, PIG script writers, which is uh, considerably easier. There's more people who could, who could pick up that skill, probably. Um, so then Facebook came along with a project built, uh, again on MapReduce, called Hive, uh, adding SQL queries. So now you open to a huge audience of people uh, who know SQL, uh, could now have those turn into MapReduce jobs and take advantage of this. Still batch-based. Then, uh, Google, somewhere in there, published a paper uh, about a, si a system called Bigtable, uh, uh, which is a NoSQL no data store um, uh, that's, um, that very, that's built on top of the distributed file system, uh, integrates with MapReduce, seems like a great thing to have, and some folks went about re-implementing a very similar system called HBase on top of Hadoop. So now we have a an online key value store. It's not a batch system. New, new kind of system on this platform uh, that lets people build interactive applications um, that are very, very scalable. Uh, HBase supports a phenomenal insert rate, phenomenal uh, lookup rate, um, uh, scales to, to very, very large uh, uh, data sets. Um, and in that vein, we started to see more non-batch systems added as well. Um, uh, a year and a half ago, coming up on two years ago, uh, Cloudera rolled out Impala, which is an open source SQL engine that isn't batch based, that's interactive, um, that will return you know, SQL queries uh, in, in most cases in, in seconds rather than minutes or, or longer with, with uh, batch based MapReduce. Uh, so a tremendous improvement um, uh, and opening up a lot of applications um, a, lot of, a lot of SQL applications as assume uh, that results can be interactive. Um, uh, so you bring in more users by removing the, the batch constraint. Um, uh, similarly, um, uh, this last year, uh, we rolled out uh, search integrated into Hadoop. So uh, Lucene has sort of had its parallel life going on uh, in, the, in the background here, and, and folks um, over the last few years have worked to make it work in a, in a distributed manner, scalably, so you can run Lucene over a, a grid of uh, you know, 10, 20, or, or more uh, machines, um, and have it index and uh, petabytes, and um, uh, serve very, very large query volumes um, uh, through this, this uh, the, the using more, more hardware to be able to search bigger collections and, and uh, serve more queries faster. Um, but it was a separate system from Hadoop. It didn't have any uh, integration. So you, you, you separate storage, separate models of users. Um, uh, there weren't a lot of uh, bits of glue to glue it into other parts of the, the, the emerging uh, Hadoop ecosystem of, of projects around Hadoop. Um, and so we set about, uh, over, over the past couple of years, um, trying to glue that system, uh, it's called Solar Cloud, um, on top of Hadoop um, to make it be a first-class citizen. A uh, big component of that was getting indexes to be able to live in the distributed file system so that uh, storage is now integrated uh, between the search system and the other systems. Uh, then uh, having the um, events that are flowing in, uh, the system called Flume for, for uh, adding events in uh, to, to Hadoop, which can feed them into HFS, feed them into HBase, can now also uh, index them directly as, as they arrive. So real time, um, as uh, things are happening, logs, whatever, um, you can have them indexed and available for search within seconds. And then have this very interactive, scalable search engine. Um, integrating uh, security, integrating uh, management, all these, all these levels of integration are now there so that search is a first class uh, citizen of this platform. So again and again, we're seeing new kinds of functionality, new kinds of computation, new kinds of operations move to this common platform where they're sharing data, sharing resources, sharing computation, sharing memory, sharing networking, uh, 
and it becomes the, the locus um, uh, for computation. Um, it's, it's a new way of, of thinking about things. Rather than having uh, different systems uh, for these different type of operations, have a general platform that these different systems can share um, and try to adjudicate the resources between these competing systems uh, so that you, you, you give the most economical system. And you also avoid moving data. When data gets big, it gets very expensive to move it very slow. Um, and you pay a, a huge performance impact um, for doing so. And also, you have to store multiple copies of it. Um, and you're tempted to buy you know, exotic networking hardware to let you do that. And it's much simpler if you can move processing to data. Uh, so if you have a storage system that can expose where the data lives and permit computations to move to be close to that data, uh, then you can build much more economical systems on, on top of that. Um, so uh, prediction here, again, fairly simple. I think these, this trend's going to continue. Um, uh, we will continue to see uh, more kinds of computation move to this platform. Uh, you know, we, we're, we've already seen, in addition to the ones I already mentioned, uh, graph processing, uh, in-memory computing, stream processing. Um, all of these are things that are now available and integrated with the Hadoop platform. Um, not as separate siloed systems, but as integrated things. Uh, and I think that, that trend is, is only going to continue. Um, so wh wh where is Hadoop now? I mean, it's, it surprises me, because um, when, when I first started this, I assumed that there would be a lot of competing projects, that you know, Microsoft would roll out its uh, sort of version of a distributed file system in MapReduce or some similar engine. In fact, they talked very early on in Hadoop's life uh, about a system they built called, I'm um, blanking on the name, um, Dryad, thank you, um, Dryad Link, uh, and, uh, and assumed that would come out as a product, uh, you know, assumed that IBM would have its own that you know, again and again, people would, would come up with competing things and that there would probably be other open source ones. And that hasn't really happened. Um, across the board, people seem to have accepted Hadoop as the standard for this kind of processing. Um, we've got Microsoft endorsing it, Oracle, IBM, uh, you name it. Um, every, just about every major player um, in technology um, ha has endorsed this platform, um, much to my surprise. Um, uh, and so it's, it's become this, this standard way of centralizing data within organizations, um, of removing silos, um, of, of getting, getting economies um, uh, out of, uh, of your data. Of, so in many cases, people will adopt it to cut costs. In many cases, it lets them do things that they wouldn't even think of trying before. Um, because it would be so prohibitively expensive. Um, uh, and we're, so we're seeing all sorts of, of new use cases um, come up. So the, the prediction here is, I, I, again, I, I see this trend continuing. Um, I think uh, Hadoop is becoming uh, the central component of an operating system uh, for data that's, that's emerging, an open source operating system um, that is becoming the standard platform for, for data management. Uh, you want to ask, how, how far can this go? Um, and uh, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't see any real limit. I mean, the, the, the sky seems like it's the limit to me. Um, I don't know what kinds of workloads you couldn't bring to this platform. It is a very general purpose platform. They're probably, it's not to say that everything will. Um, uh, there are certain exotic workloads, I'm sure, that will benefit from uh, exotic hardware and, and particular configurations that are very different than everything else. Um, but I think those are going to be more and more the exception. Um, you know, the, the sort of um, holy grail of, of uh, databases is uh, OLTP, online transaction processing. Um, and Hadoop doesn't currently support that. Um, but it's, it's possible that it, it could. And if it's possible, I think it's inevitable here. Google, again, demonstrated a um, uh, year or so ago uh, in, in a couple of papers, um, uh, one about a system called Spanner, um, how they are able to do uh, transactions, OLTP, on a system that has many fundamental uh, similarities to um, the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, and build an, build an OLTP system that scales globally um, uh, on that. Um, and I think 
it's a, it's a tricky thing to build. That paper, as I recall, had 21 authors, which um, uh, to me speaks of uh, how much it, worked, it was probably to build that. Uh, I don't think we're going to see this tomorrow. Um, but it seems like it's something that would be awfully useful um, uh, to have uh, more scalable um, uh, and, and more cost-effective um, uh, OLTP. Uh, and somebody's going to do it. Um, I think we're starting to see some of the baby steps today. Um, and there'll be more steps. Uh, and again, more and more of these kinds of workloads will move to this platform. So, so my prediction here is that uh, there's, there's little that's not, not possible here. Um, uh, so summing up, uh, you know, without trying to be too grandiose, or, you know, I, I really, uh, <laughs> it's, it really looks like Hadoop is going to be the central component of data management um, uh, in, in the future. Um, uh, all the trends point there. We're not there today, um, but it's, it's growing quickly, um, and people are adopting it at the rate that they adopt new technology. I mean, you've got a lot of install base in a lot of companies. Most institutions don't turn over their technology every year. Um, uh, so they're, they're still, it's still a minority player, um, but if you look at where folks are going, uh, they're not rolling out new solutions using a lot of the existing enterprise technologies much. Um, the vast majority of, of new solutions that are being developed in, in companies, are, they're trying to adopt these sorts of methods, this sort of approach. And that's only going to accelerate that trend uh, as this technology gets to be more mature, as it better supports uh, the kinds of things that companies need to do. So it's not all about Hadoop, uh, much as I'd like it to be. It's really, I mean, Hadoop got something started here and we've seen this huge explosion of projects and, uh, around Hadoop. Um, so we, we need another name for that. And we've been calling that the, the Enterprise Data Hub. Uh, and it's this, this different architectural style that rather than having silos um, with exotic uh, hardware running uh, expensive proprietary software, you have an open source um, based uh, kernel that is running on a shared resource uh, that you bring data to. That's where data lands. It's where the bulk of your data processing happens. Uh, maybe if you need to do something special to it, you can pull it out and back in. Um, but it becomes the central point uh, for data within organizations. It's a different design uh, th than we've seen in the past. Um, we think it's a better one. We think it's more economical. Um, uh, we think it's more powerful. Uh, and uh, it brings a wider array of tools to your, your fingers without having to uh, import and export things. Um, you can directly, uh, for example, um, with Impala, you can run an SQL query um, right over the, a flat file um, that you then run a MapReduce job over uh, in, the, in the next minute without doing any, any load um, uh, or, or transforms or anything like that. It's, it's, it's right there um, and available because it's, it's shared. Um, so this is uh, what I see as, as the future. Um, I'm uh, curious to hear what all you think. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, welcome Derek up here, I guess, uh, to, uh, to question all this. <laughs> Thank you. Doug draws a crowd, that's for sure. <laughs> and I should say, so at our structure conference last June, I interviewed Jeff Dean and I said, I kind of owe you my writing career, a big portion of it. So Doug is like, if Jeff is one, Doug is one A or vice versa or something, right. I don't know, because I, I write a bunch of dupe a lot. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here and kind of talk to, to this crowd. Um, Doug, I want to start off just like with, with the question that, you know, I, th I think I upset half of the executive suite at Cloudera yesterday. I'm not sure by just it was a, essentially a a comment on Impala, right? And you know, this the sequel on Hadoop and the expansion of Hadoop into these different spaces. I mean, so my, my what, I, what I'm wondering is like how how far can Hadoop actually expand into the data management space, right? Because like I mean. To, to say like Hadoop is, or Impala is faster than a database, a, a relational database implies 
that you might actually re replace your relational database with Hadoop, right? We are seeing a lot of customers uh, who are not necessarily ripping out and replacing, um, but they're um, capping or decreasing their spend on relational, relational systems as, their, um, uh, as their business continues to grow. Uh, so what they're doing is they're, they're taking workloads uh, that they were doing there and they're moving them to Impala. Um, uh, they're finding that not everything moves yet today. Um, Impala's still adding a lot of important features. Um, uh, windowing functions are going to be added uh, this, this quarter. Um, there's, and that'll enable a whole bunch of new workloads um, to move to Impala. Um, but for a lot of simple uh, ETL stuff, for a lot of you know, simple analytics reporting, um, Impala can do it faster and for a lot less. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a better, better way of doing things. Um, right, I, mean, I mean, so is, is the, I mean, is there a point then? So, you know, Hadoop has moved so fast from like, it's a batch system to, you know, it, it's, it's threatening Vertica and Oracle and, and whomever uh, to some degree? I think it's definitely something they should be and are concerned about. Um, uh, it, it's not going to happen, or it's not happening overnight. Um, as I said, you know, uh, people turn over slowly the software they're using. Uh, you know, I heard this story on the radio the other day. I don't know if you heard it about the, um, uh, I don't know what the system's called, but it's that banks use to transfer money between one another and why it takes overnight to do it. Uh, and it's the same COBOL program that was written in the <laughs> 60s uh, that they, when they first enabled electronic transfers, and it's still the same thing, and it's still got, and, you know, it's, it's hard to change these things. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of systems out there um, in, in the, you know, our, our Fortune 500 companies, which they're not going to change, you know, in some cases for decades. Um, uh, but when they do, uh, they're thinking hard. They, they, they know they need to scale better. Um, uh, and we're also seeing a lot of, you know, adoption in, in new areas. But, but more and more, we're seeing people using it as a, as a cost-cutting means, um, uh, where they're taking existing workloads um, out of more expensive solutions and moving it onto this right. uh, as well. All right. And I should point out, too, um, if, you, if anyone has questions, Step up to the microphone. There's one in the middle, and I will take them as they as they come. But I have lots myself. So, um, so kind of moving on, you know, in terms of again, in terms of the, the I guess the the scale or the breadth of of Hadoop, right? How much? I mean, so you came from Yahoo, obviously, and Yahoo drove a lot of the early, you know, maturation of Hadoop. How how much can you know a company like Cloudera or any of the other Hadoop vendors at this point? I mean, do you expect them to drive? The vision, or is it still going to be in Facebook, or I don't know, Microsoft, or whomever who are using this stuff in different ways, doing it? Twitter. I mean, Cloudera's um, launched a number of open source projects that are now at Apache um, that are pretty fundamental components of the ecosystem. So we, you know, we launched um, a Scoop, um, Flume, uh, Crunch, and I, I probably a handful of others that I, I'm not thinking of right off. Um, so, you know, vendors are certainly having a lot of impact. Um, uh, I'd say probably more than the uh, Facebooks and Yahoo today. Um, uh, other folks do come up with, with things as well. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag of where things are coming around. No I mean, what, what about, like, as, as you look to the future of what this is going to do, right? Because I, think, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, thinking of things like Storm, for example, mm -hmm. right, which came out of Backtype and then Twitter kind of took that over, right, and Facebook, you know, is, is, is on its own building Corona and Presto. And I mean... There's just a lot of stuff, and Google is, I mean, doing some, obviously not on Hadoop, but I mean, can, can a company like Cloudera, as it's focused on serving these, these enterprise customers, I mean, quote unquote enterprise customers, I mean, did you have to look to these other places for, you know, those maybe that, that cutting edge or that next big? We, we certainly read all the research papers and, and try to stay abreast, but we also listen to a lot of what our customers are, are asking for. Um, that drives a, a lot of the, the new products and innovations that we make. Um, is, is synthesizing. Um, we don't, nothing gets done without four customers needing it or something like that. Um, we, 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 we don't, we, we're motivated a, a lot by, by what folks uh, expect and demand. A lot of that is um, filling gaps um, between what, uh, you know, the, the traditional enterprise software that's developed for, been developing for the last 20 years uh, has built up and what this, this uh, younger software has. So that, that's a, a big role for a company like Cloudera where we're bringing it to Fortune 500 companies, we, we need to fill in those gaps um, in a way that um, uh, Facebook and Yahoo don't yeah. um, because they don't have a lot of the same uh, constraints um, and needs. Um, uh, but I don't see there being any, any shortage of 
innovation, um, uh, and uh, you know we're, we're happy to take it wherever it comes from. Uh, we recently started um, working with Databricks to ship Spark, uh, which is a, a basis of a lot of neat work out of um, uh, Berkeley. Um, uh, Storm is um, uh, I, I help bring into the Apache incubator, uh, and is um, now now getting uh, will will soon be an Apache project as well. So I mean, is Spark going as? I mean, do you see Spark as like the thing to? Spark undo map reduce at some point. Yeah, Spark is pretty amazing. It, it does almost almost everything and in memory, so it does it very very fast. Um, it, it's a neat platform. I, I haven't spent a lot of time with it, but I'm I'm pretty excited by it. All right. Um, oh, question. All right. Yeah, I have a question for Doug. So there is a huge movement uh, as we see the replacement of the traditional relational databases. Uh, one of the big winners right now is MongoDB in the NoSQL space. And because they have owned the hearts and minds of the developers, JSON, transactional systems, and the positioning seems to be a peaceful coexistence with Hadoop. You know, for batch analytics and all that, it is Hadoop. For tra transactional systems, online OLTP. So I was intrigued by your comment that Hadoop eventually one day will become the OLTP engine. Uh, and that's, I have a tough time seeing that. I don't want to be misquoted. I don't think Hadoop proper, Hadoop the project, Apache Hadoop, will become an OLTP engine. I think that the Hadoop ecosystem will include an OLTP engine um, uh, that, that, will, that will use components from Hadoop and, and other projects. So you mean um, Hadoop and all the animals, pig and hive and yes, scoop yes. and... In that, in that space and, and with okay. it. But, but um, to answer your, the other part about Mongo, I mean, architecturally, I, I strongly believe um, that the less you move the data, uh, the better. Um, Mongo is pretty inherently a separate system, separate storage system uh, from Hadoop. It doesn't share um, any resources um, or, or resource management or any of those things. It's, it's very much its, its own tent. Um, uh, and I think long term that's, that's not a good design. It's a, it's a separate system you have to install, run, manage, um, uh, coordinate users on, and all those kinds of things. Uh, I expect that users will gravitate towards things that are integrated um, uh, together and not want to run multiple systems. I, I disagree, but you can argue. Okay. <laughs> All right, one more qu question. Okay. okay. So, uh, great talk, but it's too short. My question is, uh, <laughs> my question is, uh, probably it's quite stupid, you know. What is the future for computing? What is the future for computing? <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you know, data, now forget about big data. Even data, it totally depends on how compute handles, you know. Quantum. So that's computing. Yeah. You know, I'm. I. I, I don't know. Um, I, it's. It's not. Uh, not something I. I have spent a lot of time thinking about, and I'm. I'm not, 100% sure what you mean. Um, I mean the new paradigm. New paradigm for computing. You know, <laughs> single node, and you know, uh, from mainframe to client server. Then we have P2P, mass label, whatever, you know, a lot of things happening. And it link from, from OS point of view, from Linux, right now people think about data, data center virtualization or, you know, cloud operating system. That's all about computing, you know. So I guess um, what I'd say is that falls into the class of prediction that I'm not comfortable making, uh, that, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying that there, there couldn't be fundamental changes. There, there may well be um, uh, fundamental changes, but those are the kind that can't predict that aren't linear extrapolations. Um, and and, I, and I, I certainly don't see them coming. Can, can, can I put a data spin on that? Like, wh where do you see Hadoop fitting into, you know, so IBM last week launched the, the Watson business, right, which is supposed right. to be a $10 billion business. I mean, where, where do you see Hadoop fitting into this, this new, this, this new, for, I guess I'm struggling for the word here, but the, the paradigm, I guess, of, of AI systems and machine learning and, and this stuff. Right? To some degree, I mean, if you look at what Watson, hypothetically, cognitive computing can do, you know, that might, you know, upper or supersede Hadoop to some degree, right? So where do you yeah, see Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Watson uses Hadoop internally, is my understanding, uses Lucene, that it's, it's based, based on a lot of these technologies. Um, uh, so it's, it's, a, um, it's a higher level uh, application, um, uh, and, and I suspect that most of the things that we uh, might consider AI will use similar methods. We'll, we'll, we'll need to perform some sort of um, bulk computation 
over very large data sets, um, and this will be the platform that those will develop on. Um, right. So uh, I, I, would, I would call that an application All right. um, from my point of view. Okay. All right. Yeah, you may have touched this on the end with your data hub, but it seems like the definition of Hadoop is evolving. Uh, I usually thought of Hadoop as a map reduce system, but a lot of things happening now, like Spark and others, are really just using HDFS. So is, is Hadoop really HDFS, or is Hadoop <laughs> really MapReduce, or when you talk about Data Hub, it's, what it's do you a, really It's doing? a fair question. That's why, in, in some ways, some reasons, uh, for, why I brought up the term Data Hub, yeah. is because it is confusing. I mean, Hadoop is a project at Apache that includes a distributed file system and a MapReduce engine, and that's it. But like Linux, Linux is a project that supplies a kernel, which is pretty much unusable on its own. Uh, and what, but when people say Linux, they refer to a large suite of tools that run on top of this. Um, they generally don't re mean Android um, or Chrome OS. Even though those build on the Linux kernel, they mean um, uh, you know, X Windows, uh, Emacs, um, uh, et, et cetera, and, and, and th those kinds of tools. Um, and, and APIs um, uh, and, and, and libraries um, uh, for Linux. So Hadoop is often used that way as, as the term for this set of tools that are built around the Hadoop project. So um, that's what and, you think, it's a, the term's evolving. Yes, now, we're not using evolving. Hadoop as this broader. Um, right. Great. All right, one more question. Great talk. Um, Hadoop is very dynamic, evolving, changing, and it's rethinking how things work. And I'm wondering how do you, would you uh, elaborate on the idea of uh, security measures and think, protecting data and thinking about security in this really kind of very different type of environment? Because I think it's a lot of challenges for thinking about it for people like what I, I do, UX design, but thinking about how to manage the security. Yeah, um, so uh, some years ago, um, uh, the, the, the first big security in initiative happened in, in Hadoop, and it was um, fundamentally around um, uh, authentication and authorization, um, and not about encryption. Uh, and so that's been in place, and it's fairly solid using, using Kerberos. And it, it continues to be rolled out to you know, add finer grained um, uh, uh, authorizations, um, uh, role based authorization. Um, but, but this notion that um, you need to know who somebody is, you need to be <laughs> confident that they really are who they say they are, um, and then you can restrict what they do based on that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily provide the, the data security that a lot of people uh, uh, mean. Um, the way that's been traditionally managed is with firewalling. Um, you have a, a, a data center cluster, um, and you, um, you limit access to that um, uh, to people you trust, and you assume that within that, people aren't going to get a uh, super user and be able to see everything on the net. Now, since then, we've added encryption on the wire to just about every, every tool. Um, uh, so now you, you, you don't need to trust that people uh, can't spy on the, on the network. Um, uh, encryption for data at rest is provided by third parties. Um, uh, there's, there are people who are, are uh, working to get it uh, into the open source platform um, so that all the data can be encrypted. I'm not 100% convinced that's effective, that that's not a, um, a placebo, uh, uh, encryption of data at rest in a distributed system. Um, I, I think there are some well-known examples of organizations that encrypt all, encrypted all their data at rest, and yet they have system administrators who have a, the ability to get the keys to that data and to distribute it to everybody who they don't want it distributed to. Um, right. and, and so that's, it, it's, it's very difficult um, uh, to, to do that well, um, uh, to encrypt data at rest so that both, um, uh, I mean, ideally you don't want to trust your administrators, um, uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's hard. Um, <laughs> Clearly, right? right? I mean, yeah. So, 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 so that I mean, that's kind of sort of like, what's the? I mean, when we look at, so we could look at the target breach and the Neiman Marcus breach, Neiman Marcus breach and um, the NSA and all, all these things, right? What's the, what's the answer then to? Or I mean, what I mean, what's the? I mean, you know, and then if you read the mainstream press, right? The, you know, there's kind of an underlying drumbeat of privacy and security. There's just, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of you know scary aspects, I guess, of big data. I mean, what's the, you know, the, the answer in a system like Hadoop? How do you actually? I think you can build systems where you don't have breaches. I mean, I think you can, I think you can do it with firewalling without encryption at rest. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I think that's, that's workable. 
Um, uh, you know, and you, you have to, but you have to, be, it's like security anywhere. It's something you really have to be, be attentive to uh, and, and, and be wary of. Um, uh, we, we hope there aren't uh, more breaches that, that uh, embarrass uh, Hadoop, certainly. Has there uh, been a big Hadoop breach? I Not mean, that I know of, but I don't, I don't ask, you know? <laughs> <laughs> are people storing that sensitive data? <laughs> um, oh, I am certainly are, yeah. So, I mean, what we focus on is regulatory compliance. Um, in a lot of industries, there's, there's a lot of um, details about what can be stored with what, who can see what, um, and there's expected standards of how that is accomplished. Um, and we have a lot of customers in, you know, in finance and in, in a lot of industries where it's, it's required that they, um, that they do these things the way they, you know, the law says, um, and we help them to do that. So, you, I mean, you can achieve um, uh, security that certainly conforms to regulations. Um, whether that's enough to also stop breaches, I don't know. It's, there's no, it's like uh, predicting computation. It's hard. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, this question is about um, open source and perhaps the quality of open source. Um, and I ask this particularly in the context of data. Um, a lot of us are holding on to data for the long term. And... Uh, in addition to using open source technologies, we're also careful about which open source technologies we pick, and there are some specific instances in the Hadoop ecosystem of technologies that have um, kind of polluted the name and the purpose of open source because of the kind of technologies that have introduced. And I'll, I'll name one that I've heard a number of times uh, that deals with processing SQL on Hadoop. So the question is, one, because SQL has... Um, all kinds of uh, morphology around who has implemented it and what it can do. The introduction of SQL into Hadoop and the Hadoop ecosystem is, is um, it's likely to pollute the meaning of open source and create a single implementation approach as opposed to a standards-based um, uh, sort of abstract definition. What can you do to ensure that an open source platform is also safeguarded against the likes of technologies that become a single source standard by implementation? I guess I'm not as convinced as you seem to be that standard by implementation is a bad thing. Um, I think if you've got a, um, uh, and I, I also don't think standards by you know, APIs are, are a bad thing either. Uh, that's, that can be, that's a useful thing that permits multiple implementations that compete. Uh, it tends to be more interesting uh, when you've got proprietary implementations. Um, uh, than, than open source, source, honestly. If you've got um, people who are collaborating effectively um, uh, on, an, on an open source platform, then using the implementation as the standard um, is pretty effective. Um, uh, and and if, if somebody dislikes the way that implementation is working, they can fork it freely under the license, um, uh, modify it as they think, um, and if they can do something better, it's a good chance it'll get merged back in to the original, or there can be, be two competing implementations. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't see a fundamental problem um, with uh, standardization by implementation um, in, open, as, in open source. Uh, do, do, you, do you see one? Um, so you know, I authored the index DB specification that was used as the basis for implementing databases inside browsers. And I did that when SQL Lite and the web SQL um, uh, specification was the basis for implementations in the uh, Chrome and, and WebKit-based browsers. Um, and, of course, you know, various vendors did not want to do that because it was one st standardization by implementation and because there was no way to externalize behavior that was mandatory for everyone to implement. Um, so at least in the web interoperability world, and if you go to anyone in IETF, they would never agree to standardization by implementation. Now, it might be different strokes for different folks, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I, think it, I think it depends. I mean, if you've got a, a world where you need to have different implementations, then a standard is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, specifically, I worry about this because I don't want to have to write code against a particular implementation that runs on Hadoop, but that there is no one else who is willing to write that kind of an implementation since it cannot perform well, since it mm. cannot be implemented in a real-time fashion, for example. Standards in many, many cases have not lived up to their promise, right? I mean, SQL is not SQL, right? From one implementation, it's, it's the, the, there are not that many portable SQL applications. It, takes, it generally takes work to move something from one implementation of SQL to another. Um, uh, so I, I don't think um, uh, standards are a panacea, um, but they're certainly a, a, a better start than, than no standard. 
So, so I have a different open source question, sure. which is, you know, maybe related, but along the lines of, and this is, you know, touches on something we talked about before. I mean, what, what, what's your take on, the, you know, the greater open source Hadoop community, let's say, or big data community, like like the Facebooks, like the Twitter, because everything, or seemingly everything now, is open source, right? Whether it's the GitHub, whether, so I mean, mostly it's the GitHub, right? Some other places, but like, I mean, how does that tie into what you look at with, with a, within Apache or within Cloudera or within anybody? I mean, how do you, I mean, look at that as a, as a, as a way to build the platform, right? Or some new best practices or? Yeah, I mean, so if things are on GitHub, um, uh, a lot of people are, are fairly cavalier. They don't, you know, some people don't even worry about what license is under. Um, uh, some people don't necessarily uh, keep track of who's contributed. Um, uh, and so uh, GitHub can be the Wild West. Um, it can also be different. Some companies can run their, their uh, part of GitHub um, very, very tightly and can actually manage all those things. So it, it it's, depends on what project you're looking at there. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing that the degree to which people are collaborating now in public on software. Um, and we're seeing you know, tremendous strides there. So it's great to have a place for things to get started, a place for companies to go public. Um, it's very easy. I mean, everybody now posts something first on GitHub, and then they decide, who, are we going to collaborate with somebody else? Are we going to move it to a, a foundation that's going to provide greater guarantees, that's going to better facilitate collaboration among competitors? Um, so it's a, a pretty, pretty exciting world to me. All right. So, so I mean, is it, it sounds like GitHub is like the the breeding ground for Apache projects, is that? I'd uh, say de facto more than any other. I mean, right. there, there's Google code, there are a few other, other places like that. Good old SourceForge is still out there. Yeah. Um, but but uh, GitHub seems to be the dominant one right. today. Is there a concern at all about the speed? I mean, you talk about some of the things Hadoop can be, or the ecosystem, I guess, can be. Is there a concern about you know, the speed of this? I, I spoke with someone from a, a large web company several months ago, and he said, you know, we would have liked, we're still waiting for whatever, you know, Impala, something like that, you know, but they, they kind of said we wanted it and it never came and it's still not mature enough, so we have to build it ourselves. Like, is there a concern when you look at Hadoop as an open source thing, you know, first and foremost, not first and foremost, but, main, you know, as a thing that where, where you can't keep up with some sort of demand? You know, it's a different model. If um, it's people scratching their itch um, and they're not going to scratch somebody else's itch necessarily. Yeah. People, people don't do that. So. Just because if you want something, I do. <laughs> uh, if you want something, and you know, you can hope that somebody else will build it, and that might work, but it's not a very reliable way to get it. Um, you can hire somebody to build it, and you can build it yourself. Um, uh, but you know, you, you, I think complaining if somebody else doesn't build the thing that you want is kind of lame, <laughs> uh, <laughs> frankly. Uh, <laughs> and you know, so I mean, we, we try to build the things, we try to prioritize the things our customers want, and try to build those. And I imagine that's what most, most folks do. Um, and uh, if uh, whoever you're talking to presumably wasn't one of our customers and telling us <laughs> we really need this now and this is the features we need, yeah. or else we might have we yeah. done it. Is, is there a concern over a, a fracture right among? I mean, this is like the, the open source question in Hadoop, right? With whatever, how many different distributions are out there and everyone working on their own. Pro, I mean, even for stuff that is getting built, everyone seems to be working on their own variety of it, right? Their own flavor. SQL on Hadoop is like a classic example right now, but I mean, is there, a, is there a concern that there are 10 different SQL on Hadoop engines, 10 different, you know? There is proliferation of, of SQL on Hadoop. Um, everybody seems to want like to have their own. or something, I don't uh, know. And, uh, you know, is that a good or a bad thing? You know, I, I, don't, I don't judge. Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, in some ways it's good. You get competing solutions. Um, you can try to, you know, it's, you get a, um, a survival of the fittest. We'll see which, which ones win. Um, you've got some, uh, Duplicated labor, which is unfortunate. It'd be, it might be better if everybody was collaborating on one thing, but people seem to think they all want to have their own. That's so, right. where we are. Um, I mean, but again, I, I think it's, uh, it's one of the people complain. It's sort of like people complain that somebody doesn't donate something to open source. It's like, dude, you can't do that. But what if it's, it's all voluntary? What if it's all an open source, though? I mean, what if Impala is open source and Stinger is open source and Drill, all in Apache? Or, I mean, I mean where, where's like the, the. Why aren't people collaborating? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, outside I from commercial I mean, interests. Um, uh, I think you have to ask the people who are working on that. I'm not working specifically on any of those projects, uh, so I, I can't speak directly for them. Um, uh, I think they think they've got a better way of doing it, um, and they want to, um, and they think they've got, they've got an angle on it, um, and so they want to, they want to, you know, prove they're right. Right. Um, is, is my best guess. I mean, it's hard to generalize across all those. I think each is probably a slightly different story, but that would be probably the, 
the one that I would, I would guess is most common. All right. I'll take this opportunity to plug okay. our structured data conference in New York in March, where uh, Tom, or sorry, Doug's boss, Tom Riley, was speaking, and the Hortonworks CEO, and Paul Moritz of Pivotal. So we can talk all about, I guess, the business strategies of it, right. but I just wanted to I'll just crowbar that in there. Okay. Uh, I have two questions, uh, one technical and one not. The technical question is, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about running Hadoop and software from the Hadoop ecosystem in fully virtualized environments. And I'm wondering uh, what uh, changes or evolution that might require if we're not already there. Uh, the second question is I'd like to hear your thoughts about viable business models uh, in the Hadoop ecosystem for companies other than the size of you know, Facebook and Yahoo and... <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, virtualization. Um, you know, classically, um, Hadoop does not run or isn't optimally deployed in um, virtualized environments. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it runs best, uh, most, most efficiently, just directly on, on hardware. Um, there used to be a significant performance penalty. Um, that's gotten better, uh, and I don't remember exactly what it is right now, but there's, there's still a performance penalty of a, a, a few percent. You know, there's just something significant, but, but not, not huge. Um, it doesn't give you, if you're running Hadoop in a virtualized environment, it doesn't give you the benefits that you get in many cases from virtualized environments, um, where you might be able to um, encapsulate uh, a VM and move it around and replicate it freely because in Hadoop, a VM has a lot of storage attached to it. And you, you really want to um, have that be local storage um, and not be fully included in, in what you think of as the VM. Um, you want it to be talking to the local drives directly uh, if you're going to get decent performance at all. Um, uh, so you don't get all the benefits of virtualization. Still, there are a lot of places, a lot of companies, institutions that like to manage their hardware using those, those uh, virtualization tools. That's the way they run their shop, it's the way they run their data center, uh, and, and it works. Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Most, if, you're, if you're working with a Hadoop vendor, you're gonna get software that will help you deploy, um, help you manage um, all of the hardware so that you don't need any of the tools that you get from a virtualization vendor to manage uh, the hardware. Um, that said, if you're running Hadoop along with other things and you wanna manage them all together from a single console, then, then it, it might work well for you. So it's, um, it's not the most optimal, um, but it's not the end of the world either if you do it. it Doesn't it that kind of go against the, the grain of, I mean, the big push has been toward consolidation, right, and eliminating and, you know, the fabric approach and flexibility, and all of a sudden you say, well, if you're going to standardize on Hadoop as the data platform, here's a, like, here's a big set of servers or whatever that do nothing else but Hadoop, right, or that, that are, I mean, it's, it's back to, like, the anti-cloud computing yep. sort of. But, I mean, model, think, about, right? think about Amazon. Amazon's a big Hadoop vendor, right? They, and, and you can bet that they're running it all virtualized because um, that's what they are. Yeah. They're also a big virtualization shop, and they're going to they're gonna build it on top of that platform. Um, uh, I, you know, they don't t obviously talk about how they, they build things, yeah. but I'm assuming uh, that when they're running, running Hadoop, it's, uh, it's virtualized. Um, so they're, they're you know, people for whom it makes sense. Um, uh, we don't generally recommend it. Um, Certainly you'd install. Right, virtualized. I mean, customers. Uh, it's, it's similar to the um, the cloud question. Um, should you run Hadoop on premises or in the cloud? Um, and people oftentimes start out running it in the cloud, um, but uh, it oftentimes ends up being too expensive to do it that way. Um, and it's it's much more cost effective um, uh, to to run it locally in your own data center. So, but you know, there isn't a right or wrong um, necessarily. All right. Thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, second question. Um, so what are some business models um, around, uh, around Hadoop? Well, I mean, Cloudera's business model um, is, is very much that of an enterprise software vendor. Um, uh, we we uh, sell um, subscriptions um, uh, that give you a, um, uh, you know, software you can install um, uh, and use to manage your cluster, your hardware resources, as well as manage your data. Um, uh, we still keep you from being locked in to um, uh, a particular uh, implementation because all the APIs you're going to develop to are, are the open source ones. Um, uh, 
And, uh, and so we, we sell this combination of software with support for it on, on a subscription basis, along with some uh, services around that, consulting and training and so on. Um, so it's a fairly conventional software business model, um, uh, enterprise software business model. Um, uh, there, I mean, there's other, other folks out there um, doing variations on that. Um, uh, I think, I think that probably the majority of our competitors would more or less fall into that um, uh, description. Um, then there's sort of higher level tools vendors, uh, which again are analogous to, you know, you've got um, Tableau, you know, which has been around for a long time. Um, uh, and now you've got some newer competitors which are more Hadoop specific like Zoom data. Um, uh, and so that it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any um, huge surprises there. Open source makes it a little trickier. Um, uh, how can, you know, for how you build a business um, uh, when the, the, a lot of the software is free. Um, Red Hat has uh, in, led the way in, in showing how that can be done. Um, uh, one is that what customers really want is binaries and what open source projects produce is source code. So there's that distinction. Um, uh, and then there's um, the ability to have some components which are proprietary, which are your, your special sauce, but which still avoid the lock-in uh, that people uh, fear, rightfully fear, from, from proprietary software. Um, and, uh, and, and Red Hat has had that role in, filled by various things at various times. Um, uh, but I think that's a, that's a, a model that, that lots of folks follow. What about the business return for users? I mean, is there, well, I mean, how big is the return on, I mean, is analytics, I mean, is, is there that big of a return on investment and in just running analytics? Do you have to actually learn to build, you know, products or, you know, you know kind of that net new sort of thing on Hadoop? Like, where, you know, where do businesses, I guess, get that aren't, like, I think he was asking, like, that aren't Facebook or that aren't Google, for example, get that return on investing in this? Um, Cause like just running. Well, the simple one is, is simply they can, reports, they can right, take their, the answer, their right. Tableau and, and, and move it off of um, Netezo or Teradata and on, onto Hadoop and um, run it on more data for less. Right. Um, uh, that, that's, that's one simple one, but they can also do things like um, uh, do a better job with fraud detection. Uh, writing a, a fraud detection, uh, you know, machine learning algorithm uh, on a classical, classical relational database is, is not easy, whereas writing it in you know, MapReduce, there's textbooks telling you how to do that kind of stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a much more natural um, uh, model for a lot of, lot of operations. Um, uh, so. All right, so I mean, it sounds like figuring out how to do newer stuff. I mean, because just doing those same old reports on bigger data isn't like, that exciting or that, the payoff might not be that great in the It can be a lot. You'd be surprised how much these companies spend. Um, if you, you take some of the largest retailers in the country, you take, they, they have huge bills they're paying every year to vendors. Um, um, but I mean, the, the goal of Hadoop can't be just to cut your bills, right? I mean, there has to be a bigger, no, a bigger picture. No, right? no, but right. that's a, you know, um, uh, we, you know, these businesses are going to grow and they're going to they're going to adopt more uses and they're going to they're going to find they can do do other things. All right. Uh, thank you, Doug. Um, question that bothers me is the classification. What uh, what amounts to be classified as big data? Whether the of file size, simply the data size, is the measure of uh, whether it qualifies as to be big data and Hadoop um, friendly environment. And as an example, two, I see two opposite sides. And one would be the, what would be trivial Hadoopable Hadoop thing, which would be billions of people faces, images that you would like to classify, maybe analyze, group, find common features. And on the opposite side would be something much more heterogeneous, which would be maybe the same size in data, like uh, millions or thousands of uh, gigapixel images, like you know those that where right. people yep. take uh, many shots and combine them. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so that thing is much trickier, seem to be to, uh, maybe it's superficial, to my understanding of Hadoop, but what about, uh, do you see it as, as applicable? Is it as, uh, is Hadoop as, is as useful to do um, complex, potentially complex analysis of these large images that are very heterogeneous between themselves, but uh, may still can find? That's a good, good question. So, um, I mean, big data was the, the 
word of the year for 2013. So we, 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 I, I haven't got it out of my slides yet. So we need to, now we're just saying data this year. Um, but uh, it, you know, I, I, I think that you need how to generally, uh, when you have more than you can easily do on a single machine, uh, more than you can store, more than you can process. And in many cases, both of those, more than you can store and process, but maybe also in some cases store or process. Um, uh, you know, it may not be the perfect tool for every application, um, but building a distributed system is really hard. Uh, and for a lot of applications, it might be good enough and get you the scalability you need at a level of affordability um, that's good enough um, that you can, you can solve your problem. Um, and to solve it with optimal hardware resources um, uh, might be possible, but might take you five years of development. Um, but, and if you can get, get close to that, and you can, there's a lot of variables in, in, in Hadoop you can play around with, with how many drives, how much memory per node, um, how fast a network, um, and you can deploy things. So I mean, we, we see people who are um, operating on big chunks of data at a time. Um, there's a, um, a satellite imagery company, who's gonna help me with the name that just launched their first Skybox. satellite? Skybox. Skybox. Skybox is a, is a, is a Hadoop shop. Um, those are big high resolution images that they're, they're processing and analyzing and storing in Hadoop. Um, we also see people with lots of little tiny, you know, log lines, um, very, very tiny records um, they're, they're processing. Um, both kinds of things. I think there are people for whom, you know, their workloads are very I.O. intensive. Um, uh, they're, they're not doing much processing. They're mostly schlepping bytes around. Uh, and there's people who are doing very little I.O., who read something. Uh, I think a lot of um, uh, genetic analysis um, uh, is, tends to be compute, more compute intensive than data intensive. Um, but in either case, uh, you can benefit by having this platform that manages the scalable reliability, uh, both storage and, and compute. Um, when I um, was moving Nutch onto this platform, um, I made the crawler be a MapReduce job. Um, now, if you ask anybody who's done any, read any literature about writing web crawlers, they would never do it as a MapReduce job. But I didn't want to spend a lot of time writing another distributed system and management of, of you know, keeping tasks running and monitoring. And so I was like, you know, it'll work. And we'll get it to run on 20 machines. Um, and it'll be you know, within 50% of optimal. Um, and that's good enough for now. Later, we can come back and, and replace that with something else um, if, we, if we need. Um, so uh, anyway, I think, it does, I think there is a, a wide range of applications um, uh, that are that can effectively use the hardware, and then there's an even wider range um, where it's good enough and not worth trying to invent something better. Um, now we're seeing new um, kinds of paradigms added into the Hadoop stack that better support uh, different kinds of computations. You've got in-memory computing, uh, graph computing, these kinds of things um, uh, in a lot of cases uh, play well for if, you, if you've got a, a problem which doesn't sound like a, a MapReduce problem. Does that answer uh, what you're asking, more or less? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned before uh, the issue of uh, that you would like to have uh, data to be accessed as uh, fewer times as possible, so uh, pooling data, basically, uh, moving around. And uh, for these kind of images, for example, if you would like to find the features on the large image, you would like to keep sections of the image that are proximal to each other in proximal locations in the compute environments to prevent this issue of data moving. Right. Uh, so it, does it create additional difficulty? My question is basically, does it really create uh, particular uh, difficulty in uh, these distributed environments, or it is actually my little understanding of, of, uh, of this system? It's, it's, I mean, it's hard to know precisely uh, in, the, in the case you're talking about, but it, it seems like something that, that should fit fairly well. Uh, it doesn't sound like a, a horrible mismatch. Can I ask, is there an ideal? I mean, what's the ideal? I guess I mean, maybe you just want to talk about MapReduce because if you get into graphs and everything, right, there's a whole world of things, but what's the, I mean, is there an ideal MapReduce application? Um, and is there an idea? I'll, and, and what, my question is: Is an ideal because big is obviously a misnomer, and it's kind of been blown yeah. away. But is there an ideal size that you should be running Hadoop at or scale as well? 
I don't think so. I mean, I, I think um, MapReduce is just a very general hammer uh, that you can use um, in a lot of cases um, uh, and, and a, in a surprising number of ways. Um, uh, in a lot of them, I suspect, if you really wanted to take the time, you could craft a more optimal solution that wasn't based on MapReduce, and, right. and probably most of them. Um, uh, but it's, it's simply not worth it. I mean, if you, if you read the original Google MapReduce paper, uh, they talked about um, the amount of effort they would go through each time they changed the um, prior uh, system for, for um, in creating indexes and processing, processing the web, um, and how much more easily they could do that after they had the MapReduce system. Moreover, they could optimize the MapReduce system and see payoffs at, across all these components. So while in theory you could optimize each component, in practice you may not. And they, some of them might be a lot worse um, the, the custom one than this general purpose MapReduce engine, which can be optimized and optimized once and everybody can benefit from that. Um, so it, it's um, not, a, there, isn't a, there isn't a single best one, there isn't a single optimal size. I mean, we just see, tend to see people start with, you know, 10 nodes or so to, to play around, five at, at least, sort of, right. um, and then up to thousands. I, I don't think anybody's done a lot with things bigger than 10,000 or so. That seems to be as far as people are pushing it today. All right. On the generalization front, like, so, I interviewed a handful of old Yahoo, exe former Yahoo execs, since they old, but former Yahoo execs recently, right? And a couple of them, you know, had this, you know, they, they have, I won't say an anti-Hadoop bias, but it was kind of like Hadoop spent, or Yahoo spent way more resources and used Hadoop for things they absolutely should not have done for. But it sounds like maybe this is a, a, a cultural thing or a mindset thing where you're saying, get over it. <laughs> like, it's, it's easier to have a general purpose tool than to rewrite a new system for each specific job you want to do. I mean, it's like anything, you would want to do a cost benefit analysis. You'd want to say, um, it, it's, you know, we can get this running in, in an hour as a MapReduce thing um, using PIG or something like that. Um, uh, is that, is that useful? Um, probably is. Um, uh, is it costing us millions of dollars a year to run it that way? Ooh, maybe we should think about, you know, how much would it cost us to build something that, that does this better or to use some different system? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's case by case. Uh, right. It's hard, hard to make a general answer there. All right. um, Thank you. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was reading about, and, you know, the 2014 big data predictions, and uh, Cloudera CTO, Amar Abdallah, said that uh, the competitors, a couple of them he named, would be bought out. <laughs> Uh, do you think, probably, I don't know, he's biased, maybe, but uh, from your, you know, like, father of Hadoop role, not as a biased Cloudera <laughs> employee, what do you think, is, it's good for Hadoop uh, innovation, or what is your view, I'm just curious about. Is it good or bad for companies to be bought out? No, not for the companies, for the Hadoop as a whole, innovation in Hadoop area in general. Right. Um, uh, I, I don't think it would necessarily change things a lot, I mean, it's presumably, um, uh, companies would be bought by um, uh, large players in the um, uh, you know IT world, um, uh, and they'd buy them because they were contributing and innovating in the Hadoop space, and the company wanted to get a head start in doing that itself. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't buy them to shut them down from being involved in open source. Um, I, I don't think um, that that's. Uh, you know, that's the, the value of, of uh, people who are working on these projects is, in many ways is that, they, that they're working on these projects and, they, and they, they've, they've got that know-how. Uh, so. uh, yeah, in general, startups tend to innovate a little faster, I think, in general, a little faster. For example, IBM has a lot of Hadoop expertise. I don't know, there are IBM guys, but you don't see too much stuff coming out into the open right. source. So something right. similar might be happening if the startups get bought out. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think it would be a, a, a bad thing um, uh, outright by any means. Has it surprised you how much Hadoop has forced some of the vendors that weren't associated with open source to embrace? And Microsoft is one that comes to mind, right? That now, I mean, I mean, it still uses its own stuff, I guess, internally, which might be a problem. But you know, in terms of just a unified vision, or but like, but on the Hadoop front, right? I mean, it's totally open source is contributing stuff. It's doing, you know, using re releasing machine learning projects on top of YAR, and like, yeah, I mean. So yeah, I, mean, I guess I was thinking, you know, this is more of a statement, but when, you, when I think now of like Microsoft buying a Hadoop company, or whomever, it's not like the innovation stops because they've seemed to have right. embraced it and kind of get it at this point. No, it is, it is really, it's pretty impressive, um, uh, the, the change we've seen. Um, you know, IBM, though, has been uh, very involved in open source for you know, a, a decade or more now. 
um, and, uh, and yet they still have a lot of proprietary software. So it doesn't, you know, and, and Apache in particular embraces, um, uh, you know, the, the proprietary software as well. It's not a, it's not a religion that everything needs to be open source. Um, open source has a, a lot of uh, advantages, um, and it seems to be, that those seem to be being, you know, realized here. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a surprise. Um, uh, it's, it's a stress at every one of these companies. It's interesting from my point of view to watch a company go through the process of learning how to do this because it goes very much against the culture and all of the contracts that that company and the league, you know, it's just like, it's, it's you know, at, at Yahoo going through this, it's pulling teeth to get a, a big company the first time to allow its employees to contribute to open source. Uh, they, they really are not set up to this. But once they're over that, uh, then, then they seem to, to move right along. All right. Thank you. I've got two questions. Uh, we talked about security a little while earlier, but it was mostly around data security. As an app developer, um, I'm, the question is more around ACLs. I mean, I have a big pool of data. I have user one who can access a subset, user two allow, allowing, you know, can, who can access a, third, a different subset. Are there any sub-projects or references that people have done this successfully? Um, I'm fairly new to Hadoop, but I have not seen anything. Have you looked at Sentry? No. Sentry is a, a project to um, add uh, finer grain security to Impala and Hive and uh, kind of what else it, it works with, um, but it, at least those two. Sure. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice library. Um, Cloudera did a lot of work on it. Uh, Oracle has, has one of Oracle's uh, involvements in, um, uh, in the open source uh, contribution. Um, uh, here, so okay. um, yeah, have a look Thank at Sentry. That's sure. a good one. Um, and there, there's more and more of that coming along, but that, that's that's one that just specializes in in that kind of security, um, uh, as 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 and then applies that to these various systems. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, the second question is: uh, you talked about not moving data and uh, or moving the processing of the data, and that's the common theme of Hadoop. Uh, but is there any contract? for the different subcomponents of Hadoop or the different components of the ecosystem to have the same format of data? The question that comes to mind is because you mentioned about solar cloud. Uh, I mean, Lucene has its Lucene indexes, but it's its own format. I mean, if I'm trying to use Hive on it, it may not work, so. That's right, so you don't get the, the, you're not gonna use a Lucene index file directly from a, a you know, because it, it's it's a program that only makes it's, it's a format that only makes sense to Lucene, um, but you do still get some advantages. For one, you get the management advantages. You you don't have to um, manage another pool of storage. You can have a single pool of storage, and you can allocate users and applications and, and groups different amounts of that. Uh, you don't have to have another authentication authorization system and whatnot. Um, uh, but also, um, you can write MapReduce jobs that. Um, run Lucene, do Lucene operations on indexes. Um, so you can um, build, so if you've got a, um, a large data set um, uh, and you need to regenerate the Lucene index from it, you can drive that from a MapReduce job uh, and it will take advantage of the fact that the MapReduce job is running, has a HDFS locally when it writes that index and so you get efficiencies. It's not talking um, uh, through some unusual path, it's talking through the very normal uh, output path that MapReduce is used to writing into, into HDFS. Um, uh, similarly, if, you've got a, if you want to write a MapReduce job that, that reads a bunch of, uses Lucene again to read a bunch of indexes, you've got it right there in, in HDFS distributed. Um, uh, back on the management side, if you want to have, um, uh, you know, um, uh, disaster recovery um, uh, um, and availability, you know, you've got some, you're mirroring to some offsite and things like that, the tools for that, you'd rather not have separate and manage that all separately. You'd rather have that integrated. So, um, there, there definitely are advantages. Um, you're right, the format matters. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not magic. Thank you. Perhaps the last question. Yeah. My name is Andrew Felch. I'm a co-founder of Cognitive Electronics. We've designed a computer processor that can do mappers and reducers at higher performance. Uh, so my question would be, uh, what, do you have a feel for what percentages of MapReduce apps or Hadoop apps uh, benefit from more network versus more disk versus uh, more compute power? Or in other words, which are disk bound versus network bound versus compute bound? Because 
our computer processor really only helps with compute bound tasks and it would help to get a feel for what, what you think about that. I think it varies a lot. Um, uh, I mean, a classic, um, uh, it, it, it's really hard to say. So if you look at a lot of the optimizations we do, so if you look at um, uh, Hive, for example, uh, running an SQL query, um, uses a lot of CPU. Um, you look at Impala running the same SQL query, it's I.O. bound. Um, and so it you know, depends a lot on the implementation, um, and there's a lot bundled up in, in those implementations and, and what they enable and, and how they work. Um, so even with the same um, processing, you know, same, same problem in many, in many ways, um, uh, the implementation will, will change the balance um, uh, one way or the other. Um, uh, and then between different kinds of queries, um, you're gonna see uh, different, different breakdowns there. Um, uh, I mean, again, I think there are cases that are definitely compute intensive. Um, uh, genomics, uh, scientific computations in general tend to be very compute intensive. Um, uh, physics uh, kind of simulations um, uh, tend to be um, uh, more compute intensive. Um, uh, so those are the, the areas I'd, I'd probably think about first. Um, Thanks. Right. I'm, sure. I'm gonna end with a softball question, Doug. Which is like, we, so we talked a lot about the ecosystem and you know, all the things Hadoop is becoming that's not right now. What's the, which, which project, I guess, you know, in the ecosystem, or maybe not project, but something you'd like to see you mentioned, like a Hadoop version of Spanner, let's say. I mean, what, what has you most excited, I guess, as you look, you know, as you look to this non map or beyond map future, right? What's the? Um, boy, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I hate to pick favorites. <laughs> pick. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I'm very, really excited about the Spark stuff. Right. Um, uh, it's neat to see that, that come together. Um, uh, that those guys have been working on this for a long time and it, and it finally seems to be really um, uh, at that, that point where, where it's um, usable by, by a wide audience. Um, and uh, they've, they've got an amazing, amazing combination of facilities um, and uh, with, with, with pretty astounding performance. Um, so that's, that's, that's something I'm excited about. I mean, I tend to toil away on, on Avro in the, in the back rooms uh, and trying to, trying to get there to be a, a, a common data format. Uh, and I, that's, so that's, always, that's what excites me, but I, I like the boring stuff. <laughs> I was, was going to say, I don't think that's yeah. good. Yeah. All right. Well, great. I think we're out of time. Um, I know there's one, one more question. Um, maybe you can corner Doug in the office yeah. stage. <laughs> so uh, there was a question then right. about uh, storage administrators or system administrators, for, uh, which are the potential threat of losing the data or going out of the organization. So uh, how, uh, like, let's say someone wants to use a cluster file system, a distributed file system, which is also uh, directly accessible via operating system, and using encryption at operating system rather than having it over Hadoop. So uh, does that give an advantage in a big data environment? Because we can now separate out encryption on operating system and uh, on the application. Well, fundamental problem as I see it, again, I'm not a security expert, so um, uh, you know, somebody can c correct me. Uh, if you've got a distributed system, let's say you're running a MapReduce job, um, mm -hmm. you've got your data encrypted, um, uh, you want to run it through a map function decrypted, and you want to be able to run that on nodes around the cluster. So somehow you have to get the credentials to decrypt it, distribute it around the cluster to every node. Um, and doing that in such a way that a super user on one of those nodes can't see the clear text data as it's flowing through the mapper or, or more likely even see the, um, uh, the, the decryption keys um, is really hard. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know that you, you, at least to my understanding, my, and again, I, as I said, I'm not a security expert, I, I don't see what leg you have to stand on to get, um, uh, to, to both get the keys out there distributed to the, to the job that's running um, you don't know exactly which node it's going to be running on, and hopefully it's on a node where the data is actually stored, but it may not be. It may be tra tra you're traversing the wire and arrive encrypted, and you need to decrypt it. Um, uh, so you, you need to have the key distributed, um, but you need to do that securely. It, it's kind of the problem with um, DRM in, in, in another way. It's, at some point, your TV's got to turn the picture into a picture and, and not random bits. Um, and you can intercept it at that point. Um, and probably you can even intercept it before if you watch a little bit of what's going on, you can probably get the, 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 the keys. I mean, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's exposed. Okay. Um, it's exposed on the network, it's exposed on the processors. If you've got administrators who can see 
every bit of memory on every machine, you can't hide stuff from them. Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard problem. I mean, now again, maybe you, do you have a, a, am I missing something? No, because uh, in high performance computing world, they try to use all these distributed file systems because uh, at the hardware level, they might be using uh, like uh, adapters like InfiniBand and all, so that across the nodes, there's a data communication and there is security also implemented. At the same time, above that, when they are running HBase or any applications, so it stays uh, sync at both the level. Security is also obtained at network level. Uh, the nodes are communicating with each other using the InfiniBand or all those uh, all different solutions which are coming up. So that's where I was wondering. Now having a file system directly accessing the data, encrypting it, or securing it somehow the other way, like using access control list or uh, SE Linux or something like that, and then above that runs uh, EdgeBase. Uh, so probably in not just uh, HDFS as a distribution, but uh, vendors, they could also start looking at ClusterFS. Uh, IBM does it with GPFS. So different file systems are also explored out. Might be possible. <laughs> and, uh, please join me in thanking Doug Cutting, Derek Harris for, for an incredible. Thank you.